NFR Extra follows all your favorite cowboys, interviews legends of rodeo, and talks to the best of country music. Follow Nevada Caldwell, Ryland Bentley, and Steve Godert every week as they delve deep into the stories behind the road to gold in Vegas at the National Finals Rodeo. It's revealing, comedic, and sometimes emotional. Find it on Spotify or anywhere you listen to podcasts. NFR Extra. All dirt, all rodeo, all year. kind of did a double take like he was going to go back to the, the rider so I turned my horse to go to him and sure enough as soon as I stepped to him he turned and turned and upend us and it uh it's probably the well for me it definitely was the most views I've ever got for a video on Facebook NFR Extra episode 86 what a long 365 days it's been since March 2020 guests that have appeared on NFR Extra have made the best of times including today's guests NFR pickup man Brett Sutton and Nashville recording artist ashlyn craft yeah but 21 man it just hasn't really it's still i feel like we're treading in unknown territory you know Mm -hmm. at first when this whole thing was coming out it was there's going to be x amount i mean it was hundreds of thousands of people that were they're going to die because of this deal they're going to die you know you're hearing that on the news you're like oh my gosh and i remember my wife and three kids were at home and i said i'm going to go to the store and i was the only one for for like a month and some change i was the only one that left the house to go to town and it was like gloves masks the whole thing because you didn't know you had no idea and then all of a sudden it's like all right i don't think this is that bad yeah for some people it is though it is yeah it it just when you think about it last year there was a lot of things we went through because well again you're dealing with the unknown there's probably a bigger fear there to that or like anything but like when you when you're lacking information or you're lacking knowledge of something there's a fear there right and um why were people buying toilet paper toilet paper crazy yeah which there's some actually i I, I, I couldn't list them off here as a podcast, but I've listened to some reasons why that is. And this has happened before, and I guess with like tornadoes, you know, and, or when like down south, when things get hit down there with hurricanes and whatnot, there's all kinds of the scenarios that when you know it's coming, this is kind of what happens. In Stock the- up. Yeah, totally. And I guess toilet paper is just one of them. So uh, the fear of last year was pretty interesting. Yeah. And, and Steve talking about wearing gloves and going in like a hazmat dude. I mean, it's I just didn't know. I mean, it was a different time. A different time. Well, Brylan, again, is out of this conversation. But when you have people that are dependent on you and you have little people, you know, when you have your kids, man, this is my primary focus. And you heard that, too. I mean, listen listen to everybody that we've interviewed so far and asking them what their fear is. It's like the single people that don't have, you know, have any kids. It's like, oh, man, something essentially superficial. You know, it's snakes or trains or planes or automobiles, whatever the hell. But then you talk to the guy. I said that families. It's like, man, anything happened to my family. That that would be the worst case scenario. When you put that in context of this entire thing to where like, man, I really want to be, you know, sky jump or whatever the hell. It's like, uh, no, no, I got, what if something happens? You know, there's two, when you're single, you can do things like that. And then you get a family and then your expectation of what's acceptable for danger gets a whole lot lower. Oh yeah. So we're kind of talking about this, but we're talking about this as the old dudes, the married dudes. So <laughs> yeah. Island, as quiet as you've been, my twenties, Envy's twenties, substantially different than your 20s so 21 years old what's it like going through this you know essentially kind of at the beginning of the prime of your life um you know for me obviously it's a little different i graduated college super early at 19 years old then went into the career world and now i'm in a place where event industry is what i do and events were not being produced so you go into a hospitality and we kind of watched our whole entire city shut down and that was thinking about it unreal it was one of those situations where you think that industry is untouchable honestly going into college i don't i would have said the, the las vegas hotel shutting down never happened impossible you're never gonna lock a casino up well that happens so for me right now i think going into this world i I would go skydiving right now you mentioned that those are just things you definitely live your life in your 20s 
Enjoy our conversation with NFR pickup men, Brett Sutton and Nashville recording artist, Ashlyn Kraft. But up next, Bradlin's Bull. This is Bradlin's Bull, the rodeo news of the week. Thomas Rhett, a frequent performer in Las Vegas during the NFR, is the latest country artist to announce plans for a double album with the first half of the project, Country Again, Side A, to release April 30th. The second half of the album, Country Again, Side B, will follow later this year. The road to the NFR is already heating up this year with recent winners from the RFD TV's The American. Bareback rider Tilden Hooper rides gunfire for 90 and a half to win. The big fella from Louisiana steer wrestler, Jacob Talley. From NFR average champion to American rodeo champion, give it up for the team ropers, Eric Rogers and Peyton Bray. Ryder Wright is in a league of his own from Saddlebrock world champion to an American champion three months later. Confidence was key for the Cajun Cowboy Shane Hanshey as he won the tie-down roping. Haley Kinzel, three-time world champion, three-time American champion. Colton Fritzland proves it time and time again from winning the NFR average as a rookie to winning the American at 21 years old. He covered every bull during this run. Once again, the RFD TV, The American, proves to be a launching pad to the Wrangler National Finals Rodeo in Las Vegas in December. There's only one NFR, there's only one Vegas. Welcome to NFR 360, where the NFR experience comes to life. This portal transports you to an immersive visual experience, encapsulating the stories and history of the NFR experience. NFR 360 is a collection of newly produced and historical digital content filled with stories about current and legendary contestants, the inside scoop on all the elements of how you experience the National Finals Rodeo, and inside tips that will improve your experience during the NFR 365 days a year. This is Shane Miner, and you're joining me on NFR Extra. Brett Sutton made his first NFR as a pickup man following in his father's footsteps, Steve Sutton, who is an outstanding pickup man in his own right, having been selected to pick up at the National Finals Rodeo five times. Brett is from Sutton Rodeo Company, a sixth-generation rodeo company founded in 1926, best known for award-winning PRC events, including Top Large Indoor Rodeo of the Year, Bucking Stock of the Year, and Hall of Fame Stock Contractor, James Sutton Sr. Sutton has worn many hats in the rodeo industry, from pickup man to PRCA contestant to Wrangler NFR assistant shoot boss. Under the guidance of those before him, he continues to grow Sutton Rodeo. Brett Sutton, welcome to NFR Extras, sir. Doing well. The Sutton family and the NFR, as we found out, go way back with stock, pickup men, uh, timers. Can you talk about the history of the Sutton family and NFR being involved together? As far as the immediate family, like my immediate family, um, my mom has been timer there seven times now. Um, One timer of the year award once. My sister has been uh, three times as a timer. My dad was a pickup man uh, five times. My grandma timed it once, maybe twice. And my brother's there as a flank man. As far as the rest of the family, we've had livestock at every NFR other than one. So we've got a little bit of history at the NFR. You grew up in December, probably hitting up buffets, great restaurants, things like that. (laughs) Since you were, I would imagine, since you were a kid. Yeah, um, I can remember going through, you know, casinos or circus circus stuff like that when I was real young, um, kind of in the teens and high school, we stayed home. We were all big into sports, you know, volleyball, basketball. I didn't always make the trip to Vegas, but uh, I remember hanging out in the uh, in the uh, I think they call it the nursery or the daycare at the finals, too, um, you know, with the. Uh, Riley Pruitt, when Troy Pruitt was there roping calves. So kind of grew up with with uh, other kids, too, uh, that had family and friends that were working the NFR. But yeah, I've been there a while. So and you're part of it, this this newer generation coming up in the rodeo business industry, if you will. How did you look at Vegas growing up, coming here, maybe looking at some things that, I mean, did you look forward to coming when you were over 21 years old, enjoying a little bit more of the Vegas amenities? I think like the special part of Vegas Obviously, there's the nightlife that's fun, but it's uh, getting to see 
all the different committees and people that you work with or see throughout the year, bullfighters, pickup man. I mean, usually when we're, when we do run into each other, it's at a rodeo and there's always the job to do not a lot of downtime in between most of the time. But when you get to Vegas, it's kind of, it's like a grand reunion, you know, from friends and family. And I think that's the part that a lot of people would agree with me. They look forward to Vegas, you know, even more than obviously it's a great place to have the rodeo, but it's uh, getting to run into everybody and see everybody. That's probably the most enjoyable part. Coming full circle as a pickup man in Texas for 2020 NFR with your grandpa stock in the arena in 1959 at the first national finals rodeo, coincidentally in Texas as well. What's going on? Um, I guess, like I said before, you know, having stock at every one other than one NFR is pretty neat. Comparing uh, Texas to other NFRs, emotional wise, or for uh, for Grandpa, it's just it's really neat for me to look back. And I mean, because a lot of people are asking me questions like that, so it's almost it's neat to reflect back to see where we started and where we are now. You know, we had uh, we had a buck and bull of the year and. And one of those early years, I don't think it was when it was in Texas, but it was, you know, early 60s. We went on, uh, I've had a couple of bucking horses of the year since then. Um, so the, I don't, like I said, for, for me to see where we, where it started and, you know, to know that we were there, it's, it's been fun to reflect back and answer questions on, on coming back, I guess. Do you feel like there's like some responsibility knowing it comes back from day one of the NFR? We all take pretty good pride and it's a lot of work to have a rodeo company or, I mean, it's some of the rodeos were the committee ourselves too. So I take my hats off the committees all the time because I know what they go through to put on a rodeo. And with all that work, you know, the, the best part for, for me as a contractor or raising livestock is just that, like, that's the neat part when you're gathering horses at the ranch and sorting and being around the livestock. It's uh, it takes a special uh, combination to even get one of those, you know, elite bucking horses or bulls. It takes a little bit of luck too. I mean, to to be able to see step by step the process from be, when you send in the rodeo approval till when it's over, to look back and see, you know, what you put together. It's uh, it's pretty prideful and it and it takes work and it's not all, you know, glory either. So you got to be prepared for the ups and downs, but. Uh, it's, it's something that me and my family and my brothers, my sisters, we, we all, we all take a lot of pride in and we enjoy. So a lot of the guys, Brent, that we talked to um, on the rodeo side of it, like some of them didn't start rodeoing or yeah, we just talked to one of the guys in the steer wrestling. He's like, I didn't even start riding a horse till I was 20. You come from a complete polar opposite side of that spectrum and fifth generation, not just rodeo cowboy, but talk to us a little bit about the ranch and uh, you know, the day to day and, and kind of how you grew up on that side. Um, yeah, we grew up, I remember riding, you know, in the hills with my dad and, um, one of the funnest things around home to do in the springtime is the brandings. So we go, or I, I've always went to a lot of, a lot of brandings, get a lot of young horses rode then gathering cows and depending on what branding you're at, they get to see a lot of things at a, at a branding sometime. That was kind of the ranching side. And then I, we've been competing in rodeos, you know, all through, junior rodeos to 4-H to high school so always competed and I started picking up actually when I was still in high school so just been just been horseback for quite a few years and I can't think anything else I would have rather done I guess on the pickup side too you talk about your dad uh, five times at the NFR as a pickup man has he given you any advice as far as what to expect yeah he uh he always says you know anytime I've ever went to a bigger rodeo he said it's just like any other rodeo um, he told me to picture it like it was uh, any one of our state or regional high school rodeos. Just you got a job to do and go out and stay focused and do it. And he said that he never liked all the pressure that everybody put around the NFR. Just because if you if you get too wrapped up in it, then you might make mistakes. So you just got to keep a level head and, and go about it like it's any other rodeo and do your business. Solid advice. This is NFR Extra and our guest today, Brett Sutton. We will return after the break. In Las Vegas, December can only mean one thing. 
The Wrangler National Finals Rodeo. The NFR is the culmination for the top contestants in the world seeking to share the $10 million purse and the coveted gold buckle. For fans, Las Vegas transforms into the greatest Western party in the world with the NFR experience, which features Cowboy Christmas, the Junior World Finals, nonstop entertainment, custom viewing parties, and so much more. Follow all the action at nfrexperience.com. Great moments, great champions, great memories. There's only one NFR, there is only one Vegas. Hi, I'm Fred Whitfield, eight-time world champion, and this is NFR Extra. Twenty twenty Wrangler NFR pickup man Brett Sutton is here on NFR Extra. It is a dangerous job being a pickup man, a bull, Butler and Son Rodeo. Make my day. Can you highlight that a little bit? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, there's a lot of my buddies that like to bring that up all the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> that bull on that day, we uh, is in the bull riding at Tucson. And um, I can't remember who, what bull rider was on him, but he got knocked out. In a situation like that, there's a lot of things that you got to read and, and that go through your mind. Uh, first off, try to stay out of the bullfighter's way. You know, some of those guys are, especially there too, they were some of the best in the business were there. So you try to stay out of their way and, um, you know, not add to the add to the wreck or distract from what they're doing. Obviously, your rope or your horse can get in their way and maybe cause one of them to get run over too. So you kind of got to use your head on that. But they did a really good job. And once they got the bull to leave the bull rider, he came out towards the center of the arena. So then there's a whole new uh, line of thoughts going through your head there. Um, one, he was a muley, didn't have any horns. So you always take that into a little extra note, especially when you're riding horses, because a bull could hurt a horse pretty fast with horns. So I allowed myself to get a little closer because I wanted to take a good shot and get a rope on the bull to make sure he didn't turn around and go back to the chutes. And about the time I went to go throw my rope, he uh, he kind of did a double take like he was going to go back to the, the rider. So I turned my horse to go to him. And sure enough, as soon as I stepped to him, he turned and turned and upended us. And it uh, it's probably the, well, for me, it definitely was the most views i've ever got for a video on facebook <laughs> it got a, got a little wild so the the amount of seconds that you have to have all those thoughts going through your head it's it's uh it's moments or milliseconds even i mean from the time he left the bullfighters from the time i was trying to get a rope on him it was you know maybe a maybe a one or two count and from the time he turned back on me the time he hit me was maybe half a second count you know it was it all happens really fast and that's uh my dad always has told me too, getting back to him and, you know, it's like a truck driver or anything. You got to be able to see the wreck before it happens. So, you know, maybe you're that way you're not behind in your seconds because it all does happen so fast. You know, the bullfighters, they read, they read those bulls. They, they know where, which direction they're going to turn or, you know, stuff like that. But you, you have to read it ahead of time. Otherwise you're going to be behind when the wreck happens. And, you know, the more you start to understand exactly what you're talking about here, even from an accident and it gets exposure on social media. But at the same time, I think it lends itself to a little bit more education. Could you just elaborate a little bit on what does the shoot boss do and how important it is to the rodeo and specifically for the NFR? When I was the shoot boss, I got to see like two jumps of every ride. And then I was my back was turned and I was going to the next guy, you know, getting him ready so that we can be ready when when it's time. But. Like you said, the timing for a shoot boss, he, uh, in the arena during the rodeo, he's, he's trying to prep the contestants and the livestock and the, the flank man, the contractors, trying to get them all ready so that, that you can have that rodeo run off in two hours. And production wise, a shoot boss is like the saving grace, I guess you could say it, because he's the one that, that keeps the pace going, keeps the crowd in, you know, ready for the next next thing and it just it flows on to the your announcer and everything um so i would say the shoot boss is, is crucial on that um tom newens is the shoot boss now he does a outstanding job he's got so much passion for for that and he's who was the head boss i was underneath him and and he taught me a lot i mean i've i've helped at our rodeos in our production and done it and done it there but never on the level of the nfr 
Tom Noons, I don't know if there's another guy that could do the job he does. He's he's outstanding. So it's funny because if things are all off, who's getting yelled at? The shoot boss? Um, luckily, uh, Tom's the one that had the earpiece in his ear. So Sean would be yelling at Tom. And I could just tell if he was – if he had something going on his on his ear, I knew we needed to hurry up. <laughs> Just you alone talking about a pickup man, uh, bullfighters, well, the contestant, shoot boss. So many things can go wrong so quickly, and then put you behind so many ways. Pretty amazing to think about behind the scenes in the rodeo. Yep. And as far as behind the scenes, I mean, everyone thinks that it just comes together and happens when you start the start the grand entry. But we uh, there's so much prep into it. Um, you talk about Sean's timeline. I mean, he's got it down to the second when everything should start for the shoot boss job. Part of that job um, consists of um, loading the animals in the order they need to be in so that we can follow a competition order so that the announcers know, you know, who in what order they're coming. It just makes it when you're going that fast, they have to know ahead of time who's next. So that's, I mean, we'd spend hours after the rodeo and sometimes coming in before the rodeo if there was changes to livestock or if contestants get injured. So we uh, we make a buck order and a load order. So, you know, you have to stack the horses in the correct order. And then you also have to try to follow the competition order in, in that as close as you can to that order. Uh, that's how the ground rules read for the NFR. The challenge to... Thomas and Mac versus when you're at a, you know, a rodeo like Calgary or there was some nights where we were bucking, you know, three or four horses out of the same chute. So I, it's just something that the contestants are so good too, especially the ones that have been, been to the NFR before they kind of know the drill when they, they know once they round the corner and they're in an actual buck and chute, they might only have two guys ahead of them before they have to nod their head. So they've got to pull their rig and get their glove on and then be ready to go. And I, you can always tell the ones that haven't been there before those first couple of nights there, I wouldn't say they're overwhelmed, but they're maybe just behind a little bit. It, it's easy to get into the flow, but I don't think people realize how fast it really is until you're in that situation. A lot of things taking place. I'm kind of curious from your perspective, from growing up in the rodeo business to being a contestant, to being a pickup man, to being a shoot boss, and now a pickup man at the NFR. What is the changes or like if you could n- name a major change in the animal athlete side as far as, as the stock that you've seen in the last 20 years? From what I, what I can see over the years is I think the pens are a lot more consistent as far as straight across the board on bucking horses. Um, instead of just having a couple good horses in each pen, there, there's a lot more even. And I think that is because the number of rodeos that these top level um, horses and bulls are going to, I think it's, uh, and the number of contractors that have them, you know, in the past I was, I was visiting with my dad, you know, we're getting ready to have our big rodeo in South Dakota, um, Rodeo Rapid City. And he said, usually we were the only contractor that, put on that whole rodeo um, and we did it all ourselves. It was all our own stock. Now we bring about four or five contractors there. And uh, I mean, that, that brings everybody's good, good horses and bulls together and just levels out the playing field. It makes, makes it easier to pick the, the winner who should win. Um, and it gives everybody a fair shot, you know, or a, a more, a more fair shot, I guess. Um, that's kind of what I would say is, different between now and, and back then just visiting with him and watching rodeos myself for old films um, from the last, or I guess as old as I can remember, say just more even playing field. What are some goals of yours as you get older here? I mean, there's some things that you aspire to be, right? You're going to have enough experience. I guess right now I'd like to keep picking up. That's it's even when I'm at my, our own rodeos, I enjoy that more than anything being out there, helping the livestock, helping the Cowboys. Um, I also love production. So as far as continuing on with the family business, that's, that's my goal right now. Um, in the future, who knows, you can't be a pickup man forever. It's a uh, kind of a rough, rough gig. So when I'm old and crippled, I'll probably keep helping with the family. And, uh, after that, who knows? Thank you for coming on, man. This is uh great getting to know you hear about your family. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for having me. If you guys need anything else, just let me know. Sounds good. Thank you. Yep. Have a good one.
NFR Extra follows cowboys, talks to legends and country stars, and finds the stories that make up the season that leads to the annual showdown in December. Follow me, Nevada Caldwell, Brylon Bentley, and Steve Goder as we delve deep into the stories in and behind the road to gold. Listen to NFR Extra on Rural Radio, channel 147 on Sirius XM, every Monday at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 Eastern, with a re-air Tuesday in the same time slot. NFR Extra, all dirt, all rodeo, all year. I'm Oatberry, four-time world champion steer wrestler, and this is NFR Extra. Emerging as one of the most exciting new voices in the genre, Ashlyn Kraft is introducing her own brand of edgy country music after a top 10 stint on NBC's The Voice and opening tour slots for major artists like Luke Combs, Morgan Wallen, and more. A true lifelong music lover, Kraft discovered her honky-tonk spirit and cut her teeth singing country and rock covers at a hometown bar in South Carolina and counts Def Leppard, Gretchen Wilson, Chris Stapleton, Bonnie Raitt, and John Mayer among her electric musical influences. Ashlyn Kraft, welcome to NFR Extra. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you for taking the time to come on. As uh, you recently released two wildflowers and a box of wine, tell me about that. Kind of going to what, what's going on with you with this year with COVID. And- sure, yeah. <laughs> um, so, two wildflowers and a box of wine, like you said, was just my latest release. Um, it's one of the more up tempo, fun songs that I have, and um, it kind of came about when uh, Jonathan Singleton. I was writing with Jonathan Singleton and Rob Snyder that day, and Jonathan brought in this title, and he was like. I don't know if I'm going to say this, but because I feel like it's going to be stupid and genuinely that's what I'm like, say it because normally it ends up being something cool. So um, he said it and then immediately I think all of our wheels were just turning. He said two wildflowers and a box of wine. And I was like, okay, well, you know, what does that look like? And, and it took us a while to get there, but I think um, I kind of threw out there. I was like, well, you know, what if we're comparing these two people as being wildflowers and you you know have the box of wine and the box of wine is kind of just a symbolic thing of uh it may not cost a lot you know it's something super cheap but it's just that one little thing that you can bond over so to speak out in the middle of nowhere it's um I think it's a true kind of love story about two people that are caught up in the grind of everyday life and they just need some time away from everything and uh and one of my favorite lines in the song is uh you drive and I draw hearts on the window till we can find what money can't buy and I think that's kind of the whole premise of the song for me anyways. But um, yeah, this year's been real weird, I will say, with the whole COVID thing. And it's been interesting to try to figure out how and when to release stuff, considering we're not having m- like many live performances now. So um, we finally got that one out and it's it's done great so far. So I'm very excited. Um, we've written a lot of great songs during quarantine, so to speak. And so uh, I'm excited for this next year. I think there's going to be a wave of great new music from everybody and i'm just excited to see what everybody's kind of written while we've been hanging out (laughs) how have you utilized your time you just brought up some great writers or producers basically what what's that been like for you going back over the summer kind of coming through things what have you been doing with that time oh gosh i mean honestly it's it's all flown by at this point but um i can honestly say the whole time we've since we've hit quarantine uh i've just continued to write um i'm still pretty I, what I would consider pretty new in Nashville. I've only lived here for almost two years. Um, so I'm still trying to get, you know, my name out there and also find who I write best with. And so it's kind of really just been like one big circulation of writers. And we all just, we either Zoom or the people that want to write in person, we write in person. So um, yeah, it's just, I think my time has been occupied kind of trying to find material to write about and try to find something and everything that I'm doing uh, to write new stories about, write new songs about. Um, that way I can kind of share them with other people. And I think I've also used my time to try to work on me and say, okay, what, what do I need to do from this point on that's going to help me further my career? Because it's definitely not going to be just sitting around, which I, I, I was in that phase for like the first month, but after that, I was like, yeah, we got to we got to buckle down and and it's really paid off. I feel like I feel like everybody that's continued to work since everything is kind of shut down. They've they've kept their morale up about songwriting. You know, we've all been excited more than anything about getting the new stuff out there. So it's been cool. It's been cool to see how everybody, including myself, has just kind of taken the initiative to 
work through it, you know? Yeah. It's like I said, all of our conversations have been quite interesting to see what people have done during these times. And it just proves kind of the human spirit, which, you know, you be an artist, art imitates life, life, life imitates art. I have a feeling to your point over the next couple of years, we're going to see some fantastic stuff come out of all of this. So you're on the voice. And, and to me personally, I don't, it doesn't matter if you win or not. The fact that you get to be in a collaborative type state of mind with those kind of folks and with the cameras on you. First of all, talk about the experience of being on the voice and then what has it done to get you where, you know, where you're, where you're going right now. For sure. Um, the voice was, uh, kind of on the, well, I would say on the whim, but I, I actually auditioned three times, uh, almost back to back. I auditioned two years in a row, took a year off, um, because I was, I had been in hair school back home. So I uh, took cosmetology school. And then, uh, as I was graduating cosmetology school, I auditioned for a third time, um, through just like a YouTube submission video and, I finally got the chance to be on the show and I went in there with kind of the mindset of uh, I wasn't, my goal wasn't to win my goal, which everybody loves to win. But, you know, in, in reality, my biggest goal was to just get as much exposure and much, as much um, learning material that I can basically. And like you said, the collaboration process is one of the biggest, I feel like growing things or growing processes in the voice because I kind of came in super fresh. I didn't know what I wanted to do really as far as, I don't know. I I knew I was in country music and I knew um, who I was as an artist, but I didn't know where to go from where I was at basically at home, if that makes any sense. So just to be able to come in there and have those opportunities and those doors open up, um, it it pushed me to, you know, want to move this process along a little bit further. So um, I just hoped and prayed that I can make it a little bit longer just to keep my name out there. And um, it was a very interesting experience because like I said, I was very fresh and it was more of the TV aspect than it was, you know, the singing competition. That was the side of things that I wasn't really in tune to because I just knew I wanted to sing. And so getting used to that was interesting, but it was a growing experience for me, I would definitely say, because now I'm doing that stuff more often in front of video, you know, and camera and all that stuff. And it, it, um, I don't know, it just kind of built my self-esteem up a little bit more to where I was willing to do that. I didn't like cameras and all that before. So that was the biggest learning step, I think. Um, and then, yeah, that opened the door for me to come to Nashville and meet all the people that I know now and um, Bradley Jordan with Peachtree Entertainment, who's actually with Live Nation also. Um, he was the very first person that kind of took me under his wing because he had a, a couple of friends in Nashville that he knew. And and once he introduced me to my now managers, um, everything just kind of took off from there. So I'm very thankful for The Voice because it definitely gave me a lot of connections that I couldn't have made without it. You know, you're listening to NFR Extra with our guest, Ashlyn Craft. Let's pause for a quick break. Every December, the eyes of the rodeo world are on the Wrangler National Finals Rodeo, the world's richest and most prestigious rodeo. And now you can follow the NFR all year long at nfrexperience.com. You'll find information on Cowboy Christmas and the Junior World Finals, unique blogs and content, access to NFR Extra, and much more. With the Stay in the Loop Club, you'll also have a chance to win a trip for two to Las Vegas 2021 for the world's greatest rodeo. Don't get left in the dust. Stay in the loop, stay in the know, and win at NFR experience.com Hi, I'm Haley Kinsel and you're listening to NFR Extra. NFR Extra with guest Nashville recording artist Ashlyn Craft. Could you walk through some of the experiences cuz I know that they work with you on how you sing, what you right. do performance, how you present yourself. Who is the one that you're working with the most that you really think about that man, you, you know there's a connection for the rest of your life with that. Um honestly, You know, it's funny when I did the voice, um, I initially intended on picking Blake Shelton as my coach and I actually ended up going with Miley Cyrus. Mm. Um, and that being said, people still give me crap to this day about it, but I'm like, you know, it's not the coach that makes you, they're just, they're there to help. And, and I think she was very influential in the sense of she was closer to my age. And I think I was 20, almost 21 when I did the voice, um, and so it was, it was interesting to see things from her perspective, being somebody who's, who was in the industry that at that age, 
And so I feel like I learned a lot from her just in terms of believing in yourself and having the, the drive to get, get through the song. I, I think there was one song I did when I think about cheating by Gretchen Wilson. Um, there was a really high note in there and I don't know, I've always been kind of, I've overthought a lot of things, you know, when it comes to high notes, I'm a very deep singer. So, to, so, so like, so to speak, I love all the bassier notes, but, um, but she really just pushed me and she was like, you got to believe that you, you can do it. And that was kind of a switch flipped personally for me. And so I feel like I did really connect with Miley in a sense on that level. Um, but really it was a lot of the contestants. Um, I think we got super close during the whole process and we helped each other out. We always rehearsed with each other. And, and I had one good friend, Brooke Simpson, who was from North Carolina. I'm from South Carolina. Um, we bonded really well and she is an incredible singer and she mentored me a lot on, on singing and stage presence. Cause she just, wipe the floor with it every time she was amazing she is amazing so i don't know it was a mixture of a little bit of everybody you're around artists and as long as you're able to share ideas and kind of just bounce off of each other and the egos don't get in the way man a lot of great things happen the whole miley cyrus thing you know as i've listened to her like there's things that she does on youtube for like backyard sessions and whatnot i'm not sure people realize like how good she would be just sticking with country music no doubt she is like you said is what comes down herself and her art And I think that in itself is inspiring because that's all I can ask to do. You know, when I'm, when I'm an artist, when I'm being an artist here and later on in life, I want to make sure that people know that I'm no matter how good or bad they think I am, they know I'm, I'm giving it my all and I'm being a hundred percent me. And, uh, that may not be extreme as her ways, but, um, yeah, I just want to be a true genuine artist. And I hope that just people that translates through my music and, I think that's another reason why I admire her on that end of, you know, her being my coach on the voice. So let's talk about, you got to have influences or what, what are some, some artists that you align with, maybe your voice, but even on the side of what you look up to, or you kind of necessarily aspire to be, because every artist is their own, right? You don't want to be someone else. Right. Who you look up to and what are some influences in your music? Man, there's so, there's so many. Uh, I grew up listening to a lot more male artists than I did female artists, but um, I love, you know, Bonnie Rayett. She was one of the, I think the biggest one, the biggest standouts for me, because I feel like vocally I could relate to her um, just with the raspiness and, and the love of rock, you know, that rock edge. Um, she was one of the biggest ones and I, I loved all the classics. Um, in terms of songwriting, songwriting and country music. I loved Hank, Merle, you know, all of those people, but vocally, um, yeah, I would say Bonnie, right? There's so many, <laughs> I feel so bad because every time I try to answer this question, it's somebody different every time, but, um, <laughs> and then I, I love, you know, Cody Johnson. I think what he is doing is genuine and nobody else can do it. Um, that's another reason why I love his stuff. And we're going to talk about Texas artists as well. Co Wetzel is another one, surprisingly, that I really have, taken notes after the past year um maybe not necessarily his music in his material but just the way you listen to his album and again you know it's him and you know it's Co Wetzel he has a a brand and so all of those kind of I know they're all so different I I love John Mayer um he was uh, I think a lot of my music influences came from a mixture of songwriting and uh vocals but I think the biggest one growing up for me uh, in my like teenage years was Miranda Lambert. I mean, honestly, I, I loved her and inspired and was inspired by her because she was one girl that said it how it was. I don't know. She just, she was tough and she wasn't, you know, all sappy and stuff all the time. And, and for me, I grew up with all guys. I'm a tomboy. I'm very much on the side of, you know, I, I'm not really a love song type person. And so to hear somebody sing, stuff that wasn't, you know, necessarily talked about all the time. And it, she just sang it in a way where she was like, this is me and I don't care if you like it or not, but she owned it. And so Miranda was definitely one of my top biggest influences, I would say. I love Miranda Lambert. I'm not a big country music artist fan, but she's beautiful. And I love her lyrics and the way she goes about her songs. Cause they're not, she pulls no punches. Exactly. Yes. So, all right, let's talk about some other component you do here. What, what is this? 
six string sessions all about on youtube because we have a lot of artists that are diving into this and it seems like as as we talk over the next couple years we're going to see a lot of this what what is that all about yeah so six string sessions we decided to do because um we were in the kind in the middle of uh changing over from me being an independent artist to signing with big loud and it was just a, a period of how do we get music out right now knowing it wasn't necessarily the right time to release actual music because of everything going on. So I've grown up kind of doing a lot of acoustic videos. That was kind of my thing when I was younger is posting covers on YouTube. And so I hadn't done that in a while. And I thought it would be cool to play newer songs that people hadn't got a chance to hear yet. Um, but in an acoustic setting where it was real raw and they could listen to the words and kind of know the songs before they knew what I was really going to do with them. So it was just kind of a, you know, a little taste tester. We did six songs and uh, just kind of gauged how everybody liked all the different ones. And yeah, I think we're hopefully going to do another one soon because I just, I genuinely love doing acoustic sessions because I think it, it just shows the artists. I think it shows them in real light and I love being able to do that. Yeah, I actually, um, I'm a YouTube junkie and I love uh, live music on YouTube that I can find. And I love that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't know if you ever met the Powell brothers and uh, they do this, the same thing. In fact, they work with Cody Johnson. Uh, they brought him over. They turned their ranch. They just happened to do this. Actually, they turned their ranch into a studio probably in like February. Oh, they knew the pandemic was going to happen. Right. So they were artists over there. They do their own jams. They do like a 545 or something like that, where they just do covers just like yourself once again, you know, it just, it gives everybody some sort of human connection. You did bring up Cody Johnson. So we had him on about a month ago. You're hundred percent right. If you get a chance to listen to that episode, he, he really shares a lot of like, you, you've been kind about the pandemic. Cody was not kind about the pandemic. He was to say he was pissed off was slightly kind of just, I'm, I'm keeping it down a little bit, but yeah, he was pretty upset and he shared a lot in there, but yeah, you're right. He's about as real. I like your influences. And you're with our guy, Shane Miner, who, yes. man, <laughs> oh, Shane, <laughs> you've met Shane then. Okay. Yes. Me and Shane are actually, uh, we're on the same publishing company. And so I get to see him plenty of times, me, him and a uh, gentleman master. Uh, we're all signed to 50 egg music. Yeah. We get to see each other more than often. <laughs> We didn't know Shane until this past year. So he works with our guy, Bo Gardner, and they created this Cowboy Revival. Well, we brought Shane on to the show back in August. Yeah, Shane is an interesting guy. He is just a wild card. Like you, I will say every day when you walk in or if he walks in and he sees you, he's going to give you a hug first thing and ask you how your day's going. You know, he's just one of those genuine guys, but he is such a, like a strong believer um, first of all, what we're doing, which it, I can't thank him enough for, for being that, being who he is. You know, he's had, he's had an amazing run in the country music industry. He's an amazing songwriter now. Um, and he just believes in real country music. And I think that is so important to us, especially because we are trying so hard just to give, you know, real country again. And I hate to say again, but um, it's just one of those things. I think it's been a long time coming and and he sees that and he wants to support that a hundred percent. Ashlyn, thank you for coming on. Yes. I hope to meet you in person. That would be amazing. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, God bless. We want to thank Brett Sutton and Ashlyn Kraft for joining us on NFR Extra. Want to experience more of NFR? Then visit nfrexperience.com. And we invite you to subscribe to NFR Extra on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or wherever you're listening right now. If you like what you've heard on NFR Extra, we would love it if you gave us a big five-star rating and tell your friends how to subscribe. NFR Extra. All dirt. All rodeo. All year. And the bulls and the bronx And the ladies in the skin-tight ringers And the cowboy hats